Shakespeare's Macbeth and the popular conception of computer-generated imagery might, at first glance, seem like less than obvious bedfellows. Polanski's airborne dagger aside, there are no supernatural storms or alien planets. Beyond the occasional ghost or bubbling cauldron, the play doesn't obviously demand uh, what's popularly perceived as computer-generated imagery. However, our ambition was to create a, a theatrical canvas onto which Shakespeare's words could be projected, a kind of fluid, artificial space in which the, the fleet of foot of a theatrical lighting change could be combined with the intimacy and scale of, of, of a cinematic canvas. It's a setting that would allow our film to weave together the, the outer material story with the inner psychological narrative that Shakespeare's poetry so deftly achieves. So we realized that by embracing computer-generated imagery, we could, we could sort of free ourselves from the, the physical locations that, that film is normally bound by. And that allowed us to, to create an entirely new kind of hybrid between theater and cinema. Green screen is a technique used to separate live action performances from their background environment. For our cast to be placed into the computer-created sets, um, we needed to record all of the performances in front of a green screen, which is a creative and uh, technical challenge for both cast and crew alike. So we decided to separate the shoot into two very uh, separate entities in order to focus on different aspects of the production um, at different times. Our first shoot, which was preceded by several weeks of rehearsals with our leading actors, um, was designed to focus on the cast performances and text. It's been really lovely because it's just felt like I've been in a theatre rehearsal room, which has been amazing, <laughs> you know, because of the green screen and everything. Um, it's just felt like, you know, you go into theatre rehearsal day one, you don't really have any props or anything, all you have is each other, the director, um, and it's felt like that every day. The first time I went, oh my gosh, we're on a green screen, was when uh, all of everybody else from the cast was in, and we were filming a scene which was on two different uh, stages. So uh, it was really interesting for me, because then I went, oh my gosh, wow. So I'm actually saying lines to someone, who's actually saying them behind me, but they're right there in front of me. <laughs> So that has been really interesting. And then also, you know, going through rooms and things like that with not actually having the room there, but having to feel and imagine that you're there. Uh, so if anything, I think it's been really great for me as an actor because it makes you go, OK, I really need to use my imagination and I really need to trust the fact that everything that I'm seeing right now is actually here. So, yeah, it's been a great process. And the cast has been lovely. The crew are amazing. Kit and Tom have created a room which is so safe. So actually, the process, as daunting as I thought it was going to be on day one, has been a dream. I feel quite spoiled. I'm a Celtic fan, so I love it. Apart from even in that itself, I'm like, oh no, green blindness, ah. Oh. Ring the alarm bell! The wind come. We'll die with harness on our back. It's just like almost working in a, re a rehearsal room, which is really relaxed. So I find it quite easy working on a green screen. We'll see what they do after it. You never know. It's been extremely interesting. And what, what is so helpful is having the computer screens to actually show you what the actual set will look like uh, when everything is put together and then you have an idea of what the set will be where you're working, the lodge where I exist. We originally did it with a green screen, but after reflection, uh, the director Kit and, and producer Tom thought it might actually uh, be better to actually make it distinct compared to the, the rest of the green screen stuff. So they decided to make it a proper lodge with props and, and a desk and tables and things. And in actual fact, it works better because my characters are kind of a, a, a conduit between different realities of the production. Um, he's, he's kind of like 
the mortar between the bricks, the link that, that will allow uh, the production to move on from various realities, as it were, various dimensions. So the very nature of creating an entire film in CGI meant that we had a lot of planning to do before we even went anywhere near the studio. The computer model of the sets was created so we could start to look at visualizing how we would put together the transition between scenes and essentially where to put the actors inside of the virtual space. On a technical level, the shooting process is about trying to acquire as much data as possible in order to make the post-production process as efficient as possible. An entirely CGI one such as Macbeth, you're looking at in the region of 170,000 or so frames to be individually created inside of the computer by our artists. So although the final aesthetic was a very dark and painterly one, we actually had to make the studio very bright and, and well lit for the computers to be able to accurately detect and remove the green. So we were able to do live visualizations that actually previewed the final shot uh, on set by sort of removing the green and putting them against a, a rough backdrop. The necessity for a sort of a, a perfect green screen, if you like, and actually significant amount of data acquisition meant that our visual effects team had to be present throughout the entire shoot. This first shoot material, focused on performance and nuance, was roughly edited into a green first cut of the film. So once we had the, the green edit of the film, the, the most difficult sort of technical task facing us was really to try and create a sense of cinematic scale to the film. And the only way we could do that was to find a, a studio big enough to do it in, and also a camera crane large enough to create controlled movement. In order to seamlessly integrate the footage from the first shoot with these kind of grand sweeping camera moves, the only option was actually to pre-design the movements inside of the computer and execute them with a kind of giant robot camera crane. So what we're able to do is work with the visual effects departments and the, the animators in advance to try and identify what can be shot, what can't be shot, where the problems may be, and to try and eliminate as many of those problems in advance as we can. What we're able to do is actually look at the, uh, the rig as a whole and know how fast it can move, uh, can it get up to speed quickly enough, can it accelerate up quickly enough. So we can identify, not only can you reach the move, it, is it feasibly possible to you know, get there, but how fast can you get there? And can the mechanics and the weight of this machine actually be used to achieve the shot? this particular job, there are a number of plates that have to match exactly. So they've created camera moves that we need to follow, and those plates match little inserts and little character shots which will fit inside that. So it's, it all has been tracked, and uh, we need to make sure that what we're shooting is going to be the same. We worked with our choreographer using the computer simulations to plan where our actors should and how they would move to fit in with the existing cut of the film. The on-set computers were synced with the camera and crane to display a mock-up of our virtual world in real time, which helped to make sure nobody walked through virtual walls or fell off the edge of our world. So clearly, I mean, you know, the majority of the audience know the story. Um, and that, although it clearly takes away some of the the dynamic of, 
of narrative storytelling. It also it gives you a kind of freedom to explore other areas of the kind of um, of the language. But I think more than anything, it's the fact that there is this sense that every generation of filmmakers, really since the very turn of the century, um, the last century, you know, nineteenth to twentieth, that you know, every generation of filmmakers has turned to Shakespeare and often to Macbeth specifically to, to test new technologies, new cultural ideas, new ways of, of, of dealing. So it's a kind of sort of cultural litmus paper that, 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 that uh, you know, get, gets cut you know, regularly every, well, I mean, all the time, but, but you can take these sort of 30 year slices. And, um, and rather than just making our own slice in that, which obviously we intend to do, um, we're doing it in a way that embraces and references all of those previous attempts and the theatrical attempts before that. So, so it's a kind of a fully um, contemporary, knowing version of Macbeth that we want to make. So we're, take, we're making this, as 21st century storytellers, we're making a story based on a 17th century text, based on a kind of 11th, 12th century Scottish sort of part, history part myth. But we're also embracing all of those um, theatrical and cinematic and, and you know, pictorial, visual, musical, all these sorts of references we're going to put into our melting pot and, and, and play with. So actor Stephen Burkoff has this great phrase. He says, when an actor steps onto stage in a big role that the greats have inhabited before him or her, it's effectively a process of boxing with ghosts that you're surrounded by, sort of haunted by those who have played the part before you. So if you're stepping out, as Hamlet say, you might be going Gilgood, Bath, Olivier, Bath, Redgrave, Sam West, David Tennant, Maxine Peake, go Maxine. Um, and that actually you're having to negotiate your relationship to the way in which they have played the part before you, the way in which they have said those lines before you. And it might be that you're part emulating them, it might be that you are explicitly resisting them, but whatever your relationship it is, it's in acknowledgement that they have preceded you. And I think in some ways it's, it, it's the same process with making any new production of an old play, that actually we too are having to negotiate our relationship to a really rich production history that, um, that precedes us. So that rather than just saying, we're gonna pretend there's some uninhibited line of transmission between 1606 and us, going to say no actually all these amazing productions have been layering up what we think Macbeth means in the meantime and that maybe it would even be fun interesting provocative enriching to acknowledge some of the some of the key and really influential moments in that layered legacy that we are benefiting from so I think unusually we are going to be touching base a little self-consciously with the fact that this isn't just a telling of Macbeth. It's not just a new production of it, it's a production that understands self-consciously that it's working in a rich performance tradition. Of course Macbeth was written for the stage and the performers are live, present and have a relationship with the audience in that moment in time. Modern cinema places the audience everywhere in the sense that you know the camera is constantly moving and shot from over people's shoulders and then cutting and the ability to place the audience everywhere also means they're nowhere they're not present they're unacknowledged translating Macbeth doesn't fit easily within these conventions of filmmaking how do you perform an aside when you're on top of a castle and there's nobody there to whom is your soliloquy addressed when there's no there's no audience there to acknowledge it we felt there was an opportunity to explore a, a new type of experience on film we wanted to try and create a spatial relationship, just as you would have in theatre, between the actors on the screen and the audience. So we've treated all of our wide establishing shots as if they're paintings in a frame. We cut into that painting throughout the course of the scene, but we, we never change the angle, we never change the perspective. The camera doesn't cross over into the stage space. The close-up shots in the film are the equivalent of detailed zooms into a painting. And so the audience maintains its spatial relationship with, with the performers on screen. Um, and, and the actors, when performing, were aware that they were playing out to an audience. And so despite this kind of gulf in time and space between the filming and, and you witnessing it now, 
what we're trying to do is something really very new, which is to, to reinvigorate that spatial relationship between audience and performer that theatre does so well.